Marceau. The difference between a problem and a mystery. A problem has a potential solution. Mystery, you only go deeper. Mm. He has a wonderful metaphor. If you have a problem, you lay siege to it. You and I are talking about the problem of death, the problem of getting something here. We lay siege to it, and we may get to the point of, oh, boy, that's it. And then uh, it comes close to us. I had that with my first wife's death. Uh, breast cancer, brain cancer. Nothing infuriated her more in her nine months then is when somebody would call and say, try this herb, or if you prayed more intensely, or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of reading on death, and uh, I get a, a lot of things from Catholic theologian Karl Rahner, for example, who speaks of death as the abyss of mystery, which is a really technical term in Christian thought. It's not like murder mysteries, and it's not something that has an answer. It's just the deeper you go, the deeper you go. Right. I don't think too much of the militant atheists who have it figured out. Uh, they, they live in a different myth. And uh, you don't have to pull very far to think that they think they've got it figured out. Dawkins and Harris and all these, if you just get rid of religion, you wouldn't have any bad stuff anymore. I saw somebody the other day, well, 20th century, you finally have formal atheism backed by the sword. Paul Pot, <laughs> Lenin, uh, Mao Zedong, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people killed in the name of godlessness and anti-god. Well, that's, that's a myth too. Uh, Hitler replaced one religious myth with another religious myth. These think they're not doing it and it's there too. Uh, the institutional religion is in trouble, a relative decline across the board. Mm -hmm. Certainly in participation in synagogue, mainline Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, take out the Hispanic percentage and you've got the same thing. And even many sectors of evangelicalism. Um, it doesn't always mean they've given up on God. Uh, this very day the Wall Street Journal has an editorial by Rodney Stark on uh, America's not non-religious, it's kind of transferring what its religion is. I think of military chaplains. You know, they're very busy with people they thought were secular. They, they say trivial things like there are no atheists in foxholes. Mm. But you do really think pretty seriously when you're not going to be sent out the next day. And there, uh, most chaplains report on many kinds of survivals of, uh, of ritual and hungers for it. Uh, whether that lasts all their life, I don't know. And yet they, they look for the, the rituals to find some language. So I think we do, we do, a, we do people a favor by giving them some kinds of handles. I'm a big Bach fan, and just endless, endless. And he's got all these children dying around his house all the time. Well, he writes one song, Come Caesar Tot, Come Sweet Death. But you know that when his daughter dies, uh, they have the language and it's still hard. That's why I talk about the abyss of mystery. Uh, Martin Luther's many kids, I put a biography of him, and he had a daughter, Magdalena. He said her death did more to undercut his faith than anything he'd ever faced. I think there was a time, like the influenza epidemic in the time of World War One, when it would just hit a town, and you just knew that it's going to get you, and uh, that changes your all the rest of your life. It's more fragile. Now almost anything can be tidied up in a hurry, and that means we're a little more distant from it. Um, but I don't care what happens in technology, uh, all you're doing is pushing it back uh, or alleviating you know, palliative care, which is a wonderful gift. And I think hospices, all of these are there. And yet, uh, every day you open the paper, see the obituaries, a pretty good reminder of, uh, of what's going on. And I think that sometimes popular entertainment acts as if it's dealing with death in a way that it doesn't touch us. Things are exploding in the air and bodies are all going over the place. That's not what we know when grandma dies or when your child dies. Um, so technology 
cushions the shock and postpones, but the bitter reality there is it's, it's there, it's staring at you. And he said every goodbye was really a rehearsal for death. And I have often thought of that. I can never figure out when our kids are here for a boisterous weekend, and when they leave, how void and vacant it is. And I think it's because it's been a rehearsal for death. And then what you do with it, I come here and <laughs> I write up a little follow-up. I have a son who's in St. Andrews, Scotland now. I have two emails from him today. <laughs> uh, we have all the, the ways of bridging it, but I do think they're, they're tied to each other. And it's only a trivial culture that doesn't let that come about. And I think very often the, the bar culture, uh, you live all week for Friday night, Saturday night at the bar, and texting all the time in between, there are very few opportunities for people to rehearse, and then it comes. Uh, and I, I think if I were a playwright, I would be sure that people got rehearsals for death. <laughs> I think that's the rich repertory that we get out of theology, philosophy, narrative, history. Very interesting. Um, so make it a good play. Yeah. <laughs>